My guest today is Oren Aini. Oren, how are you? I'm doing very well, thank you. Oh, thanks for being on my show again. It's been a few years since we last spoke. Uh, and we talked about RavenDB at that time, which I know is a passion of yours. Um, what, what, tell me, what's your involvement in RavenDB? Uh, I'm the founder of the project. I've been working on that since oh, 2008. Um, RavenDB has been my six or seven database project and this one stuck <laughs> i've basically been running this project uh, for close to 15 years wow and, and you were talking uh, 15 years is a long time for any software project and um well, it's a long time for anything i guess <laughs> what what's uh we were talking about what we were going to talk about in the show and uh you said there's there's some particular things that you need to consider when running a project that's going to last for many years that uh, that are that are special, they're specific to long-term projects that maybe don't occur in a short-term project? I will give you the counter-example. Uh, okay. There are many one-shot projects where the one priority that you have is getting them out of the door. And once they're out, they are either low or no maintenance or discarded after a while. I love those uh, I projects. Used to, yeah. Uh, there was a huge project in Israel in oh dear God, 2005 or something like that. They changed the number of uh, digits in a phone number from being oh. 9 digits to, te to 10 digits. Mm. And the company I was working on at the time had to write a lot of the software to migrate people's phones which meant that there was hard time pressure. We were dealing with a lot of unknowns. Once the project is done, we could throw it all away. And the code quality of that was, uh, as you can imagine, between horrible to <laughs> dear God. And well, horrible in terms of maintainability, but yeah, in terms it, of it, it did the thing it was supposed to do. Now, here is the, the, the really interesting bit about that. Uh, that was a perfect project for everything is in my head. The duration of the project is six months, if that. Most of that was done in the last two weeks, probably. <laughs> uh, so there was no need for documentation, testing, trying out things. No, you just threw things out as soon as possible and whatever worked. Compared to that... Uh, bigger projects where you have seen a, a, a lifetime of a project uh, industry, let me start from the beginning, the size the length of a project in the industry is somewhere between 3 and 5 years. After that in many cases people say oh this is uses old technology we cannot touch that blah 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 blah. Let's replace it. Let's, uh, let's write it in Rust. Let's write it using React, whatever, to, to take the two very different examples. Right. And then you realize that in three to five years, they would want to uh, write it in something else because the maintainability burden is so high. And I actually got started in real professional development for open source projects. And open source project has a real interesting uh, vibe to them. You're almost always operating in a distributed team, at least at the time that was incredibly common. I wasn't working with an established team. I just, oh, this is an interesting piece of code. Let me, oh, let me see if I can just fix this small bug. And at some point, I basically walked myself up to be the uh, one of the contributors to the project, and I brought mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the code there, and I understood what's going on. But part of that was that I had to lead, I had to, to, to deal with a lot of communication issues. The project lead lived in Argentina, oh. which is way different time zone for me where, where I was in Israel. And we were only able to communicate through asynchronous means, sure. meaning emails. Uh, 
I think and, there are. She is in my time zone, the same. Yeah, so... Chicago. If, yeah, and that was in 2004, 2005. Uh, I think there was Skype. It was expensive. Uh, and there, basically, no video conferences, very little uh, uh, voice-to-voice, mostly yeah. also because of bandwidth limitations. So sure. it was text. And it was uh, offline text, but you using emails, which meant that we had to communicate over a mail list, and we wrote uh, paragraphs uh, to explain that. And when I wanted to make a change to the code, I had to make it in such a way that other people in the team, in the project, would be able to understand and know what's going on. It also meant that I had to go into a hundred thousand lines, hundred thousand lines of code, code base and be able to make a change and do that in confidence. And again, I'm talking about things that happened about 20 years ago that had a huge impact on the way that we build software. One of those things was reading a book by Michael Feathers called Walking Effectively with Legacy Code. I've read that book. It's a very good book. It is an amazing book. I credit that for a, a change in the way that I write code. Uh, there is another book that I would absolutely love to recommend. It's called Release It by, uh, I think, Michael Tigert. I can, I'm probably murdering the name. But uh, those are probably the most uh, awesome books, the most uh, influential in the way that I write code. But the basic idea is that because we had those limitations in communication, then we had to be very clear in the communication structures, in the infrastructure that the project needed. Okay, here are the ways that you build a new, uh, you build a new feature. Here's how you verify that this is working. And all of those sort of things made a huge impact on the way that I look at things. And then I moved into, you know, professional software projects. I spent a couple of years working on a project um, it was a scheduled application for dental uh, uh, chain clinics. And I did that. I think it was a pretty nice project. I left it in 2005, came back to that for a few weeks in 2009, and I was stunned by the level of complexity that I had to deal with in order to deal with From, from your own to, code. From your, my, my own code. Because someone two years ago thought that they should be as clever as they could be. Because it's me writing the code. And the other people in the teams are either uh, sitting right next to me and I can explain, explain to them what's going on. And that was like a shock to me. And then I started working on RevenDB. And for a very long time, I just we just wrote the code. And yeah, we had unit test and we had a proper design and everything. And but we basically managed to write ourselves into a corner. And the underlying architecture was a problem. Um, we were doing too many allocations. There was no way to control that. Those sort of things. So that put a hard limit on the kind of performance that I could deliver. That was also the time when I decided that just having tests, just having distributed team and those sort of things isn't sufficient. Uh, so we had to go back to drawing basically and restructure the way that we wrote the entire project. And I took the time to do that properly, which means that I had a design document that explained my reasoning and the way to do that. and. A proof of concept to try that and a whole bunch of tests to deal with that. And we actually took something close to two or three years to refactor the entire code base. Now we are uh, five, six years after the fact, and we have three major releases since then, and we are still using the same architecture. And it's really interesting because one of the things that I have to do in order to stay competitive is to build highly efficient, high performance code. There is a name for code like that. Ugly. <laughs> ugly and horrible. Must, Look, is that uh, necessarily true? It has to be ugly in order to be efficient? Yes, absolutely. 
just to give you some uh, uh, example uh, one of the best ways that you can get to get good performance in modern systems is to use a, a, a sim single instruction multiple data uh, AVX, Armion, those sort of things. Those are instructions that operate over multiple values at the same time. Incredibly per uh, uh, high performance. You can get to times 10, times 20 better performance. Utterly, utterly unreadable. Magic incantations up the wazoo. It's just absolutely unbelievable to understand that. Um, like you, just to give you some uh, idea, think about spending three days writing a function that finds an item in an array using a linear scan that's a, that's a sort of, but again you want to do that because you can do that 10 times faster than anything else and uh, that leads to huge issues from the perspective of project management yeah. Because if I'm writing super uh, uh, super complicated high performance code, I have 50 people working on this project. Not all of them are going to be able to understand what's going on. Right. And what or is false? Or they'll take days, then lose yeah. those days just trying to get up to speed. Yes. And what is worse than that is that we are we are an open source project we also we have a commercial offering which means that they have a team of support people and my support people have to understand how to use a debugger a memory layout all sort of things and suddenly you give them okay here is um and this is an example from bug we recently had uh you have an access violation due to um Analyze the instruction using AVX in a particular uh, uh, machine. So it used to be that uh, if you access analyze memory using AVX instructions, that would cause a fault. Now, with most modern systems, it does not. One of our build servers is old enough to actually have this issue. And okay, what happens if this happens in production? This is the sort of errors that, you know, it happens only if you have the wrong alignment. Only if it happens on the exact wrong alignment, you have a whole bunch of nonsense like that. So there is a huge impact for doing the sort of things. Now, the, the typical best practices that we think about when we talk about project management or projects in general or you should have tests you should have a clear documentation you should have a, a, a reproducible builds those sort of things but what we end up doing is assuming that okay after we have all of that and we still have problems what do we need in order to get the project running because I'm going to have to go to this project in five years to this piece of code in five years and I have pieces of code right now that are 10 years old we haven't touched them yeah. and what's going on with them i have zero I, I i wrote some of them i have zero idea what's going on and uh, it's, it's, but it's we have, scary to touch them there's a there's such a high risk in touching something especially if it yeah, works yeah and this is actually a really interesting observation there is um Elder code, I call it. So the, the venerable, uh, we haven't, if he, we haven't touched it in a while, obviously it works if only because of, it always worked before. Right. Uh, we had a bug recently where someone used a piece of code that didn't change in 15 years. And they missed a value. So try to imagine that I'm saying, give me all of the values in this array and somehow you lose a value in the middle. That's the sort of thing that we freak out. We freak out about it because this is in a very fundamental piece of software, and we're debugging the code, trying to understand what's going on. Nothing changed for a while. If the the error was such a fundamental mistake that we would have caught it obviously a long time before that. What happened? Turns out that three layers up, we didn't use the API properly. But so that was a scary half hour before. Oh yeah, that you should switch the. It's a you use the while loop. You should use the do while loop or something like that. Uh, 
but I'm spending a lot of my time thinking, how do I ensure that I'm actually able to create a project like that and sustain it over time? And I think that overall, we are doing a pretty good job of managing that. Now, in some cases, you see people go say, oh, I want to split everything. So, uh, and that may be microservice architecture or a, a something similar where everything is small enough that I can understand what's going on. Yep. I really don't like this approach because in most cases, what it gives you is every single piece on its own is okay, I can understand, follow what's going on. The interaction between all of them are super complicated. Okay, I have a performance problem in the system. I have to track that through three different services, mm-hmm. and including what what's going on in the infrastructure. So RevenB is actually composed of a single process that is running. Mm-hmm. Uh, it may run on multiple servers and it's coordinated, but conceptually, this is a single process that is running. Internally, we have relatively strong components that deal with this is how you do indexing, this is how you do core optimization, this is how I write to this, those sort of things. And on the one hand, you want to have clear separation between those models. I want to have a very hard line, this is how I handle queries, this is how I write to the disk. Until you realize that this is not viable because of the performance impact. I really want to be able to make every bit count, every last value that they have. Uh, uh, so I'm making assumptions about how the data is written to disk. I'm changing the way that I'm loading data from this to adapt to the sort of algorithms that need to, do, to process for queries, those sort of things. And that leads to two things. First of all, I cannot assume that someone would go into the code base and actually be able to understand the entire thing all at once. Right now, uh, I have a time to be effective for getting a new hire to having them actually be more productive than what they cost. It's about six to nine months. Wow. So a new, yeah. So a new, a new hire, they are two years experience, let's call it this way. They're going to take multiple months just to get to grips, not with, oh, I can do a feature, but that's give a, That's them, a big okay. challenge, and uh, I don't know what it's like in Israel, but in America, uh, IT people tend to change jobs every three years. Like, I think that's the average, just between two and a half and three years. If you're spending yeah, I, months getting them trained, that's a significant yeah. part of the time you might have them. That is absolutely the case. I can tell you that from my perspective, uh, I have people who are working for me for uh, 10 and 5 and 4 years. I think that most of the team right now is 5 plus years. That's so I'm very that's lucky. That's an outlier. Yeah. You're doing much better than the industry average. Yeah, I'm, I'm absolutely lucky in this, uh, in this case because this retention means that I'm able to, uh, uh, to invest get in your much. People. Yeah, I, I invest in the people, but I'm also able to make things, uh, oh, I have a person that touch sufficient areas of the code that I can throw them anywhere and understand what's going on, which leads to a, a couple of uh, policies or practices that we found to be very effective. One of them is the not assuming that they are absolutely going to know what's going on. So they are going to be an uh, expert in every field. So, oh, you're the person who is in charge of the distributed communication of the customer. You're the person who is in charge of uh, uh, how we write to the disk, those sort of things. Uh, we are database. We care a lot about writing to the disk. Uh, we also uh, have some people who are concerned with, call it cost cutting. So I have a guy whose sole job is to make code ugly. Uh, yeah, um, 
as a side effect of making the code ugly, he tends to be able to significantly optimize the, uh, the runtime and memory costs and those sort of things. But he makes those ugly. And that means that as part of his work, he's, he's the sort of person that when you read his, his code, okay, there is tens of comments explaining why, and this is why it works on this particular model of the CPU and those sort of things. And so we make assumptions about the sort of people who are reading the code. But at the same time, we also make assumptions that, okay, this may be a support person at 2 a.m. that needs to deploy a, code, a hotfix to the customer. So we are doing a lot of automatic verification, whatever this is through uh, testing, oh, here is this, you didn't consider this particular rest condition, but we are automated that so you would get a test form when we are doing that or through a, a checks in the code itself. So uh, the code is littered through uh, debugger cell statements that validate all sorts of interesting details. And the idea here is that the code, the, the, the code itself may be uh, different between locations, but there is this overall uh, arching architecture and team that you understand, okay, I know how I'm writing the code globally. And so you can drop yourself in most of the locations and understand what's going on. Another thing that is uh, uh, served by this approach is that I'm able to say, okay, from the uh, HTTP endpoint all the way down, there isn't a lot of layers because um, on a vertical level, we tend to try to be as shallow as possible. Get a request, do figure out what you need to do, try to disk as soon as possible, and you're done, which helps from the perspective of both performance and maintainability of the system. But there, there is uh, the solid principles, and one of them is open for extensions, but for, closed for modification. So the idea here is that I should be able, when I want to add a new feature, to create a new part of that. Okay. To create, write new code instead of modifying old ones. Mm -hmm. And that uh, that end up being really useful observation. Again, we're not talking about a young project. We're talking about almost 15 years of writing features and behavior, but it still means that I'm able to basically single step through what's going on in the system in effective manner. And that has a huge impact on, oh, I don't know, I, I have no idea what's going on. I don't need to have a huge state machine in my head. Put a breakpoint here and start stepping through things and, okay, now I understand what's going on. Uh, I imagine testing has a lot to do with making these things maintainable. If you're either mo even if you're even if you're just extending code and not modifying it, you still want to make sure you haven't broken anything because of all the interdependencies. How yeah, it's that? so testing is huge. Every basically every change in the system has to every new code is covered by tests. Many of them might cover the same feature, but from diff slightly different angles. Yep. Uh, and we use that for two, two reasons. One of them is to verify that, okay, uh, there would be no regressions in the system. The other, the other thing is that try to imagine the process for running a, or developing a particular scenario. For example, I want to uh, spawn a cluster of five nodes and I want to create some data and I want to fail a node and see if everything works. So I have a test infrastructure that is able to do that. All of this in three lines of code that express exactly what I want and there is a whole bunch of test infrastructure around ensuring this happens, and all of that happens uh, hopefully completely in memory and within the same process, so I can, again, I have the ability to debug the whole uh, uh, cluster in one location. And the reason this matters is that now I'm able to have a far more productive approach to actually adding new feature. I yeah. invested the time in the a test scaffolding. So, okay, I write, so in some cases I can write, here's the scenario that I want to test. It fails, and now I can implement that. 
Now, we are not, uh, there used to be this uh, test-driven uh, purism where you right. must always write the test before the court. And honestly, in many cases, it makes zero sense. Why is that? Because when you write the test before the court, you commit to a particular line of approach. Hmm. And that may not necessarily be the best thing to do. That may, uh, that may actually be the worst thing to do because, oh, I need to change that. But now the cost of changing this, uh, the, what I'm trying to do, is extremely high. To give an example from uh, yesterday, uh, we have an API that accepted a blob in a particular format and processed that. And this is a blob that is created by one piece of the uh, uh, the code and then hand it to a different piece of code and then we did something with that and then we realized hey I'm generating a blob here and then I'm reading it here and this is nonsense let's just take the generation and throw it directly here so it will be processed in that but that meant that a lot of the places where we had a, a test that accepted uh, created and generated those blobs and processed them had to change which change something that was okay i have to change five lines of code or five locations for the code to 500 and now okay now this is a much bigger uh, cost to handle uh, it's good when you're talking about uh, features that are done because then okay especially if it's released to customers then i obviously have to uh, commit to the way that I'm building the stuff. Uh, as of last count, I think we have something in the order of 25 to 26,000 tests running, which means that uh, I literally cannot run them all on my machine. Mm -hmm. uh, they take, uh, I have to test them on ARM, Mac, uh, Docker, a whole bunch of other locations. I have to test them in different environment, blah, blah, blah. But, uh, so we have layers of tests we have fast tests that take about five minutes to one that try to uh, verify that the core of system behavior is okay. And we have a rule that whenever it gets to five minutes or more, we prune those tests. We move them into the slow, the slow test project, which currently takes about three to six hours to one, depending on the machine. We have a longevity test, a stress test, and a whole bunch of other stuff that are around that. So the typical process would be you run on your machines, you run in the fastest to get, a, a, you run the core test to get, oh, what am I doing? Run the fastest to get feedback once you're relatively certain that you're done. And then you push, and we have the steer infrastructure, a, to actually make, okay, let's build tests in all of this different uh, environment and see what's going on. Uh, it's not ideal. Uh, I used to work on a project where the entire test, test suite took less than 10 seconds to run, and that was a hard rule. But given distributed nature and right into the disk, those sort of things, I don't... We aren't able to go any lower than that without actually. Oh sure, the using, ten second rule yeah. is generally for unit tests, but you're talking about a lot of integration tests and end yeah. to end tests, which all, well, they yeah. almost never take ten seconds. Later, yeah, I, I actually really don't like unit tests. Really, unit tests. Yeah, unit tests are testing a unit. Mm -hmm. But why do we? Uh, let's talk about uh, uh, something relatively simple. Uh, let's say that you have a, a piece of code that it needs to accept text from a, the user and find similar text. Okay, so when I start writing that, I might use Levenstein uh, distance. Okay, it's very easy, there is no algorithm, test cases were great. Except that nowadays I might actually be accepting more complex text and I want to use machine learning to do that. But I cannot do this because now I have tests that verify that I'm using Levinstein uh, algorithm. Mm. So I would much, uh, and that, that's something that I actually learned that was super useful. 
one of the first thing that uh, uh, we did with Raven DP was to set up the test infrastructures so I'm not testing the uh, internal API I try to avoid doing that what I'm actually doing I'm using the client API and uh, the test is written as if I was just a client talking to a server sometimes I have test infrastructure spawn a server disable this do sort of do these sort of things but for the most part I'm writing the code as if I was writing a client that is really helpful because that means that the backend implementation I'm free to change that as long as the uh, everything happens as it should uh, what is more interesting is that this has another huge advantage and this is that I'm able to take reproductions from the client the client says here is something that doesn't work I take that throw it into my test project and I can debug that immediately we actually extended that to the point that we'll offer the same uh, uh, test infrastructures to our client to be able to uh, uh, write those sort of tests, run it in memory, those sort of things, in order to verify end to end that everything works. Um, yeah, the, I, I totally agree with the importance of end to end tests and the importance of uh, integration tests. Um, I'm not sure that I totally buy into the idea that there's no value in unit tests because unit tests, a failing unit test, does point to a specific place in the, uh, where it's failed. Whereas yeah, the question, end -to end test, if the end -to end test fails, now you've got some spelunking to do. You've got to figure out somewhere between the client, absolutely, the database, something happened, and yeah, it may take a long time to do that. <laughs> yeah, my problem is that the unit tests also serve to hinder change, and uh, one yeah. of the one of the best examples I have is that uh, I had a piece of code that accepted uh, items and put them into a sorted list and then i realized that i'm uh i'm being stupid with in the way that i'm doing that and i just because this is a process accept 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 items and then it needs to produce a sorted list why am i sorting as it com comes along what so i buffered everything and sorted in the end much much faster right. okay that's great except that all of the unit tests now broke because the code that's written assumes a certain non-functional requirement. And that's something that we saw happening right. over and over again. That's, that's a fair point. Um, let me ask you, this, your, um, this, uh, this process of, of managing has evolved over time, over the last 15 years. You've got better at managing long-term processes. But how do you know if a project is going to be long-term? Uh, many projects start out, you think they're just a one-off thing, and then it turns out, well, RavenDB, did you know that this was going to be blow up I was entire no. career when you first created it? I was absolutely certain it would not. I plan to fail on that. Uh, <laughs> and you, what I'm describing, all of this infrastructure that we need to work, none of that was written in one day. Okay. So... Paying attention to the uh, friction that you have in doing things, I think, is the most important aspect. Because, uh, oh, I have a feature that I need to, to write. How do I do that? Uh, oh, I have to uh, 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 do three steps. Let me automate it, those sort of things to reduce this friction. And it is amazing how often I, I, I go to uh, one of the things that I do, I do uh, work around the office, what are you doing? Oh, I'm working on this, this is some problem, okay, show me what's going on. And they run, they show me the problem, says, oh, that's interesting, let's do that again. And they've been doing that for a few hours or days, and they have this two-minute manual step to reproduce the issue. And in almost all cases, one of the first things that I'm doing when I'm uh, uh, pairing with them is let's write just enough code so I can do F5 and be in that scenario immediately. Because that cuts my feedback loop to sufficiently short time that I can iterate very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. And in the case of I start a new project, 
unit testing, automated deployment, those sorts of things are no longer stuff that you can consider to be, oh, they are a, a extravaganza. Those are fundamentals. Those are also, at least today, and me, basically any project you have, not something that you have to work really hard on. Give me a new project, it comes with those things. Uh, you have to be aware of, okay, how do I structure those sort of things, but not too big. Uh, once you have gotten to the point where, okay, I have automated deployment, I have automated testing, those sort of things, then you can start building on that. And one of the most important aspects is paying attention to your depth. And I mentioned that when I talk about fastest. Fastest going over five minutes is a huge productivity issue. Right. Now, we are not... Uh, now it's four minutes. It's not ideal, but we have a cutoff at five minutes. At which point we're doing this. Give me the list of all of the uh, tests by their duration. And let's take enough tests, so uh, move them to the slow test. So we are left with one to two minutes runtime for the test. And we do that every uh, year or so, we have to do that because we accumulate fastest to, to manage that. Mm -hmm. And But this process of not allowing things to to rot, because, okay, eventually you get to the point that this is 10, 30 minutes uh, a test run. And this is just a small example. Um, and then the, the process of running the test becomes something that almost never happens, at least not on the uh, developer machine, which means that the feedback cycle is so much higher. Uh, so just ensuring at all times that the feedback cycle is short is of crucial importance. The good thing about it is that as you're starting a new project, you're already in a very short feedback cycle. You just make sure to trim the grass at all times so you don't have a jungle that you have to wait through. Yeah, um, that's that's knowledge you have now <laughs> that you've learned over the last uh, yeah. at least fifteen years. I, yeah, I, I, I imagine you're much better at that today than you were. I would hope so. <laughs> uh, right, is there anything else we haven't covered that you feel like we should? No, no, I think that's it. This is this is really interesting. I'm uh, at, um, looking forward to publishing this. And uh, you do a lot of public speaking, right? Are you doing any, anything I coming am. up? Yes. What, what's coming up for you? Uh, next physical physical conference I'm going to be in is I think QCon San Francisco. I'm ah. going to pre yeah I'm going to present in there on the internals of query engines, which is my last two years also. Ah. There's a KubeCon in Chicago later in the year. You're not planning to be there? No, not this time. <laughs> Maybe next yeah. year. All right, I'll see you there then. Okay. All right, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I've been working in information technology for about 20 years. And the reason I got into that because it made sense. You know, you're dealing with computers. They are perfectly understandable at least. I thought so. Uh, and it's interesting, I, I was talking to my friends, I was really thinking about, okay, I have a perfectly logical uh, place to work. I can make sense of the, out of things. And interesting thing that happened over time is that it become less and less about the actual technology, a lot more about the people and process and what you deliver rather than the technical details that are involved.